Welcome back to Nature League. Instead of a regular video this week, I wanted to share with you a compilation of the Nature Plus segments we've done here on Nature League. Nature Plus is a format in which we explore nature topics within the context of other disciplines, like diplomacy, engineering, and the performing arts. In this first video, two friends join me to discuss how philosophy can help us understand nature. We're going to explore nature plus philosophy, basically discovering how philosophy can help us explore, learn about, and love life on Earth. So I am lucky to have some friends here to help me out with the topic, and I am so excited to introduce them to you now. So first, I will have Caitlin. Hello, <laughs> I'm Caitlin. I produce SciShow, all the SciShow channels, and so that's how I met Britt. I was a philosophy major in undergrad, and so when you were talking about doing this, we started talking about the Wilderness Act of 1964. So that's why I get to be here. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> we are super lucky to have Dr. Swazig Lebion here today, um, and she will introduce herself. My name is Swazig Lebion. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Montana. I work in philosophy of science. Um, most, more precisely, I worked for a long time on philosophy of physics, and recently I've changed gears um, to work on philosophy of ecology. So I, last semester, I don't know why I did this. I'm, I don't know. I'm glad that I did, but I decided to go on a new adventure. <laughs> And I pirated my way over to the philosophy department because I saw that there is a course being offered that was philosophy of ecology. Now, I know ecology in book form and in text and, and all of this. And it actually started because Swazig came to my wildlife department and gave a brief introduction to philosophy of science. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we both did these things. And I'm sitting here in the back, probably definitely doing other homework, and then looked up and was like, Wait, what? There's something called philosophy of science? I thought philosophy was uh, that group of stoners that didn't want to major in something harder. <laughs> you have to be so hard. It is. It is the, one of the hardest. <laughs> well, it is. And so again, like, and I learned so much. And that's one of those things, like, I love it when things prove me wrong. Like, when people prove me wrong or other things, I'm like, awesome, because that reminds me to keep my mind totally open to things. So what's cool is that all three of us work with science in one way or another, right? And so how does philosophy kind of tie into what you do, either on SciShow or the way that you think about the pieces of science yeah. that you do? I'm not a scientist, but I play one on the internet. <laughs> um, so I was doing some reading this weekend to kind of prepare for this. And just like thinking through philosophy reading and putting myself back in that brain, I think everyone should be a philosophy major. No offense, but no, I do. No, I agree now. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think it should be required that all the wildlife and ecology and science PhD students go into a philosophy class. And then this thing happened where I remembered that PhD stands for doctorate in philosophy. So there's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I was thinking about it and like figuring out what someone is communicating through the written word and then through conversation is like, I deal with that every single day. With like, science communication. With right? science communication and even just like having employees and making sure that they understand what's happening, like trying to interpret what I think my boss wants me to do. Mm -hmm. Like that like brain work that I learned from trying to work through philosophy readings I use constantly. Yeah. And then you have um, a metaphor that I love um, about how philosophy and science go together. Right. So that's not the only way philosophy can, can deal with science, right? But the, what we call philosophy of science, which is a discipline. There's philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, philosophy of ecology, philosophy of economics, philosophy of whatever you want, right? But the way philosophy of science as a discipline deals with science is basically to ask how it works. Um, so for us, all data are scientists. And the analogy that I like <laughs> is uh, Tim Modlins. Tim is, is uh, a professor at NYU now, used to be at Rutgers. What he says is that when you th can think of scientists as uh, concert pianists, and so they work really hard every day, you know, they prepare to master very technical uh, pieces, and they practice and practice and practice until perfection. And then the philosopher of science is the guy who comes, learns a few chords, maybe a few pieces and then starts dismantling the piano to see how it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's basically what we do. We look into I the inner that. workings yeah. of science. So that consists in asking questions like, uh, are models and theories um, good, uh, accurate representations of the world? Is the goal to uh, predict or is it to explain or to do something else? Can science be value free? And if it is, and if it is not, uh, what are the ways in which values can interfere with science in a way that's 
legitimate or not legitimate? Those are the kinds of questions we ask. Yeah, mechanism is one thing, but there is this higher level of why to care, what does it mean, and then what also is laden on top. So like you talk about this idea of values, and I've done uh, big data analytics, and so tried really just to double blind, triple blind everything, use numbers to tell the story. Even the fact that I asked that question though, there is my values, like yeah. they're right there. Like, of course there were values there. Yeah. I asked the question because I cared, because I wanted to find out something about biodiversity, right? Maybe it's good to recognize that. Like, I think maybe scientists in general are afraid to put that out there because it means they're doing quote, bad science. But maybe the better thing, what I've been thinking about recently is like, maybe it's good to say, hey, here's the thing. I do conservation genetics. I like a world with more species rather than less. That's not based on a fact right. or and on then science, you know, it's what I like. And then you can go Totally, on. you know where you're coming from. And that way then you can also communicate with someone who's coming from somewhere different than that. That's like, why would we conserve animals when we can just bring them back scientifically like after they go extinct? Like what's right. the difference between that animal versus the animal that went extinct? And so if you don't know what value place you're coming from, right. then how do you even have that conversation? It's true, I mean, those are the questions that you don't have the opportunity to ask uh, or to address within the realm of science itself, right? right. You, you focus on little, um, little or important problems, those are important and fun problems, but you don't, uh, you don't step back and say, well, what are my assumptions here? Why do I value biodiversity? Why is that important to me. Maybe it doesn't matter how many species we have. Why is it so important? Unless you have a good answer to this, then your work doesn't make much sense. Yeah. Right. Uh, or at least you have an assumption in within your work that you're not aware of and it's not well grounded in reasoning or evidence. And that's a problem. I see other problem, right? Yeah. Well, I yeah, now see good it research. as a problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because, I mean, the whole thing with the scientific method is it's like, oh, we learn all about this to then ask a question. Or like, what are the assumptions of the study? I've never seen in a scientific journal article, the assumptions of this study were that I value biodiversity because <laughs> yeah. of an intrinsic feeling that I have. <laughs> like, I love being outside. <laughs> right, but that's yeah. so valid as yeah. an assumption to say that you love being outside, like that, yeah. that, that is a part of that story, right? Then like, it is part of it, but it, of course, as soon as you voice this, as, so, as soon as you start articulating reasons, then you, you make yourself vulnerable to criticism, totally. right? Yeah. It's important to know where we come from, how, how we justify that, how it can be criticized, and what answers we can have against those criticism, because otherwise, again, you're, you're, you know, you're on shaky grounds. Yeah, um, all the time. But if you are on shaky ground, you want to know that you're on shaky ground. Exactly. If you're an American-born citizen and you think national parks are intrinsically valuable, it's probably because you're an American-born citizen <laughs> and you visited those parks. And yeah. like, that's a great thing, but that doesn't mean that that is the only way that things need to exist. And so once you know that, then you can stack your argument or focus your research exactly. into like why those things are important and then talk to people about how they're important. Exactly. And like ecology is such a cool place for all this to intersect. People who do ecology have gone there instead of say molecular or biology because it is complex, because it is big, right. because it is dirty and it's confusing and it's all over the place. What a wonderful playground for a philosophy of science right. approach, philosophy of ecology, because not only do you have all of those questions on the front end, but you have the questions on the back end. And what I mean by that are the questions about application. Right. So like, what do we do as managers, like as people who work as wildlife biologists for the forest service who are making a choice about that land right there. Yeah. Like, right. like those back end decisions, I mean, that, that's huge, right? That may Maybe somebody who's doing molecular biology might not have that applied field. And it's what's important to me here is that, um, you know, a philosophy can be sometimes <laughs> can be a little abstract. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> And sometimes it, it can honestly be a little bit out of touch, right? So when metaphysicists, uh, metaphysicists because there's, there are also people working on metaphysics, right? And they get paid for it too. Uh, <laughs> so they're talking about tropes and they're talking about you know, realism, about, metaphys about uh, uh, mathematical objects and all kinds of weird questions that typically don't speak to anybody <laughs> besides the small group of people interested in um, those areas. When it comes to defining biodiversity and why we value, we, we value 
value it, or when it comes to talk about invasive species, when it comes to those issues, those have practical consequences. Yes, yes big and time. And it's like financial too, right? We put money on those things. I mean, yeah. millions, um, yeah. Exactly, so we, we better know what we're doing uh, if we want to do it right. And it is a question of right and wrong it, to a large extent. And so it's important to me that we stop you know, thinking that all of this is clear and, and obvious and we start asking questions and maybe recognize that we are on shaky grounds. If we talk about the national parks, you know, the idea, for example, that those are, those are untouched Pristine. Yeah. Pristine. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. I mean, you just said manage. Like, right. Yeah. So one, yeah. it's managed. Yeah. Second, there's a history here. Basically, that was the home of people who were displaced um, or killed. Yeah. Right? And so the, the idea that that was untouched, no, there were, there were people for millennia right. on those land. Um, and you know, inhabiting this land and um, dealing with this land and using this land. So it's not untouched. I mean, that's, yeah. that has some serious colonialist meaning. So anytime you say, oh, this is pure nature. No, this is the result of a heavy history, which involves genocide. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> right. yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that we want to give up on the parks and, the, right. and you know, yeah. I don't know, but at least like, Recognize that yeah, something has happened there, which uh, don't ignore the presence and impact of um, indigenous people for uh, all those two centuries and millennia, because that's just that's just a total myth. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing here is assumptions. I think when we are we go through rigorous amounts of of learning about a scientific topic. So, like for me, I'm in a PhD program right now, which means that I've spent a good amount of time getting very specifically into something. And I think the assumptions happened so long ago right. that they are not present. So those assumptions about like invasive species or like ecosystem services or biodiversity, honestly, were probably formed in like seventh grade, you know, like, yeah. like in, yeah. in, in an intro biology class. And, and so, subtly. And so subtly. And yeah. so like, here I am carrying years of, of assumptions that are so far back that I haven't asked those questions. Right. And I'm so thankful to be able to ask them now, even though it makes me crazy. <laughs> but I'm glad that I'm asking them and I'm on my own journey with it. And so we're hoping that by kind of sharing a little bit with you that you might ask these questions too and kind of consider maybe your own assumptions or what it means to look at that ground and, and see the biases and then make a stronger, maybe more accurate and respectful story out of it. I've been doing both science and musical theater for over a decade, so I was absolutely thrilled when I was cast in a community theater production of Disney's The Little Mermaid. Next up, we explored nature in the context of the performing arts by showing the behind the scenes process of putting on this production here in Missoula. For this Nature Plus, we're going to do nature plus the performing arts. So where better to go than one of my favorite places here in Missoula, which is the MCT Center for the Performing Arts. As long as I can remember, I've always done both science and the arts. And some people always thought that was kind of weird and how do you make those match? But for me, doing arts actually makes me a better scientist and doing science makes me a better creative artist. So I'd like to show you a little bit about how life on Earth can actually inspire things that happen on the stage with this up coming performance of Disney's The Little Mermaid. There are so many aspects involved in bringing an animated film to life on the stage. One of those is costumes, and we went there first. So how are you using like the idea of what an octopus is and then bringing it to the costume, bringing it to the stage. Like, how is that process going for you? I'm uh, really just trying to think about the movement of the tentacles. Totally. What they look like. Those pieces of paper behind you. These guys are her tentacles. Like even in its paper form, you can already see the like yeah. the motion. So we've got this one, and then this is the one that's going to go in the center front. Yes. So they're all going to be yeah different shapes and lengths. And just as she moves, these are going to bounce around a little bit. I'm so excited to see it done. Will you try on a dress? Yeah, I will try on a dress. I need to try on a dress. They're going to use my body while it's here. What are these? Seagull feet. Seagull feet? 
and beaks. And these are going to be beaks when they're oh, done. Oh, look at the webbing! I just graduated in resource conservation, technically. But you have the background and pool on it for when we do shows like this that yes. have. Yes. yes. When I first started here, I said it would be really, really handy if I ever had to identify a tree on stage. I've never had to. But. No, but she makes us make authentic leaves. That's true. I'm very fussy about my leaves. Props can make or break a scene, especially when they're integral to the plot. We decided to check in with Leslie Washburn to see the creations happening in the prop shop. Cool example here. There's a flower in the show that's the she loves me, or he, she, he loves me, she, he loves me not. And so she's got to pluck off the petals. Yeah, which brilliantly are just <laughs> magnets and go right back into the center. Oh, yeah. There's a magnet in there, and then there's just washers stitched and painted on the underside. When you are creating something like that, what kind of a base are you using to create the item? So you're using like images, searching for a specific species. How does it, that work? It was some of it was looking, you know, just looking, you know, anemones or just undersea flora and fauna and getting some inspiration and then f realizing what I can physically do and what's easy right. what's not. The petals are, you know, translucent. That's one of those things that's kind of reoccurring about under the ocean is that they often have a translucency. For the psycho chef who is gutting things. It'll have a head, he'll chop it off and he'll grab and then he'll rip out the bones and shows the bones. Nice. <laughs> and those bones are based on a simplified skeleton. Yeah. And simplified then I drawn. It's That's kind of so a combination cool. of the two. To do an actual fish bones, they're so fine and everything. Yes. It would, it's so impractical because this has to get ripped out and it has to be hard wearing. Right. And so, you know, I have to make things a little bit fatter. It also has to read from the audience. That's the other important thing. There is, is that also that with I, size. I could do a lot of things very realistically and it wouldn't read because you need to be up close in order to see the realism. That's kind of like the shell. Like these shells are Right. Only like this big. Right. Whereas I needed one for a microphone for Flounder the Fish, and so I made it gargantuan. <laughs> <laughs> totally. The set for this show is massive and required a serious amount of work and design. We explored some of the set in its initial phase. Nice! Yes! What? What? I find pulling it. It gets heavier! Yes. <laughs> and of course, for a big musical like this, you can't have songs without choreography. We met with Heather Adams at the Downtown Dance Collective to talk about how she created dances inspired by the natural world. So movement in a show like this is almost like scenery. Yep which is really cool. And so what kind of a process do you think about when you have to transform people into creatures and scenery? <laughs> um, you know, the first thing I thought was I want to I want people to be able to sit in the audience and look like they're they're looking into a fish tank, a big fish bowl, or or a cross section of the sea, right? right? It, like we need to be able to absolutely transport them. That's what theater, that's the power of theater, is that transformative experience, right? You're gonna go in and feel something. So I wanted them to be there. Where does that inspiration come for you in terms of like when you're doing that research? Because I know that you do research and it's one of the things I love it's about, so I love that you bring that to it's productions. So Lots of videos. Yeah. Lots of videos of people walking into my office and I'm looking at sea snakes and I'm, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm just going like this, you know, trying. And people are like, it's casual. Um, I'm here for dance classes. <laughs> You've come to the right You've place. Come to the right place. <laughs> I love determining a movement signature. Like I don't think about dance steps. I don't think about like, okay, I have an eight count here and I need people to do something for an eight count because that seems empty to me. What an incredible wealth of knowledge looking at science, looking at how these creatures actually engage with their space. I mean, yeah. And then, and then like, oh, okay, so they, you know, they've got one little fin that really does this. So how do I put that inside of my whole, I mean, right. it is just 
rich. It is a it is a mine full of beautiful things. What were some species that you uh, got to look up that you weren't familiar with, like that weren't on your radar, mm -hmm. and then you maybe like really are digging them now? Oh, trumpet fish. It's such a funny little fish. It's got this really long face and it jerks a little bit occasionally. So that was a fun afternoon here in the studio, like looking at a video and then standing up and like <laughs> trying to, you know, like, okay, th this is going nowhere. I'm just so inspired by the way that people are embracing um, being a different species because I think one of the biggest things about acting, it's that empathy and storytelling and like you will not act well unless you are in exercising empathy and what yeah. I've realized with embodying especially seeing the kiddos embody these creatures I'm thinking like that has to be establishing some form of empathy and some form absolutely. of a connection absolutely and I think that the movement mm -hmm. is really what gets us there yeah, costumes cool. are cool but I think that that yeah. movement is where yeah. is where that connection is made I was thinking what would be really fun is if we since we're in the DDC and we have the yeah. space we should um, dance through and act out some of these animals and Brilliant. just have a silly good time Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Nature League where we do nature plus something else. This time it was nature plus the performing arts and for me that's incredibly special because I have always loved the arts and loved science. Sometimes it's hard to see those two things go together but in this production especially there were so many examples of the ways that science and nature and life on earth inspired the way that the arts came to life. This production has brought me so much joy and hopefully I was able to share a little bit of that joy with you. Um, we hope you enjoyed enjoyed and thank you so much for watching. While nature in the context of the performing arts is deeply inspiring to me, I'm also amazed by the connection of nature to more math and science-based fields of study. We next explored nature in the context of engineering by checking out some examples of everyday designs inspired by life on Earth. Using nature to inspire design is an engineering discipline called biomimicry. Like other feats of engineering and design, most biomimicry projects are directed at solving problems using innovation. It turns out that some of the coolest projects underway were inspired by designs found in other species. Low pain mosquito needles. There are a lot of people who steer clear of the doctor's office because of the idea of needles. Getting your blood drawn typically well, hurts. However, mosquito bites, which pretty much do the same thing, are initially pretty painless and sometimes unnoticeable. That's because they use a special design that reduces the surface area of the point of impact. Scientists are now working on incorporating this design into medical needles to reduce pain. Shark skin antibiotics. Antibacterial resistance poses one of the biggest public health risks of the 21st century. A lot of this resistance comes from overuse of antibiotic agents that kill bacteria. So instead of trying to kill microorganisms, what if we just created surfaces where they don't like to grow? A product called Sharklet is an example of shark skin biomimicry. This engineered surface works similarly to the dermal denticles of shark skin and provide an unideal environment for bacteria. Gecko foot adhesives. This is an adhesive developed at Kiel University in collaboration with the company Gottlieb Binder. The inspiration came from looking at gecko feet and leaf beetles. And by looking, I mean looking really closely. Gecko tape has microscopic elements that allow it to stick to wet and slippery surfaces and it doesn't leave any residue behind. Solar panels. The idea of turning light energy into usable energy isn't exactly new to life on Earth. Through the process of photosynthesis, plants have been doing this for a long time. Not only do solar panels mimic this incredible process, but some can actually follow the sun the same way that plants do, in a process called phototaxis. The bullet train. Transportation is a major area of engineering innovations. One of the most famous transportation biomimicry examples comes from the kingfisher bird. When engineers in Japan were designing high-speed bullet trains, they ran into issues with noise. Kingfishers move from the air into the water almost seamlessly, and the designs of their beaks inspired the less noisy and more energy efficient Shinkansen bullet train. While most of the biomimicry products we've discussed so far are either still in development or not really everyday items, there are all kinds of things we encounter every day that use designs that have been around much longer than humans. While some of these designs weren't inspired by life on Earth, Life on Earth also uses them. We find the designs of everyday items in many species on Earth. To name a few, I figure there's no better place than inside a home. 
So we are now here in a kitchen in a household and I've found some common items that are actually great examples of biomimicry right around the house. Straws. Simple, right? Have them around the house, sometimes at restaurants, but there are other species that have figured this out as well. One of the best examples would be elephants. The way that they use their trunks uses the same principles of pressure to move water that we use with straws. How about utensils? We use forks and spoons and knives all the time, and humans have been using them for a very long time, thousands of years, we've actually seen examples. But if you look at a common fork, you can probably see some similar designs in the animal kingdom. I'm thinking birds. So birds of prey, the way that they use their talons is really similar to the way that we grip into food using a fork. Ah yes, it's a Friday evening after work and perhaps you wanna open a bottle of wine. So, gotta use a corkscrew. But this design is actually seen a couple different places on Earth by very different species. We see this in birds with reproductive anatomy, but we also see it in the way that certain animals lay eggs. Sharks specifically will actually lay eggs that are shaped like corkscrews, and that shape allows them to tuck them away and push them into rocks to actually stay safe. It's knife time, specifically serrated knives. Serrated edges are when we have this kind of curvature going along. So instead of a flat blade across, there's actually less surface area on each point. Less surface area means that the pressure is bigger. And so that means that the way that we use these creates a completely different cut than one straight across. We see this several places with life on earth. First of all, we actually see it with leaves. It has nothing to do with cutting into something. It's just the way that their leaves are shaped, possibly to reduce things like pressure from wind and other elements. We also see this in carnivores, the way the teeth are used to tear off flesh, but even the individual tooth itself will have serrated edges, specifically something like a tiger shark tooth. So what about something like a fan blade? Well, we see this in all kinds of places, from propellers to fans to even the way that we create aircraft. Each one of these blades, if you take a cross section, is something called an airfoil. And the shape of that is actually seen in a ton of places on Earth. We see it in birds and other creatures that fly. We also see it in creatures that swim. So in terms of a fluke of a whale, you'll see that that same kind of shape, and it uses the principles of physics to allow better movement. How about this? The biomimicry piece of this isn't the actual body of the picture, but of this kind of a strain right here on the lid. This looks just like baleen that we see in some kind of whales and also other filtration like we see in flamingos, for example. Perfect example of biomimicry right here in the kitchen. And we couldn't possibly talk about everyday biomimicry without mentioning Velcro. So these are special kind of strips used to hang pictures and other things onto walls. And they use the principles of Velcro by having one piece stick into the other, like this. This was discovered a while ago by someone that noticed these burrs or these small plants that had attached themselves onto his dog actually, which then led to the invention and was a perfect design based on nature. Last fall, my friend Theo, a British science communicator, visited me here in Missoula. While he was in town, we sat down to discuss the odd and amusing ways that certain non-human species are used in international human diplomacy. We're doing a special Nature Plus that is all about nature plus diplomacy. So what better way to start off than having an international friend? Mm -hmm. We've got two Brits for this episode, me, Britt Garner, and Brit Theo Blossom. I'm a conservation scientist and a science communicator. We are obviously two different countries, but we also both have studied similar topics. So we've mm -hmm. seen them kind of from the lenses of our own countries, but we wanted to kind of talk about the idea of animals as diplomats. So the way that a species can represent its country or represent something or be the bearer of some idea or thing. Some of the first examples of absolute idiocy with um, animal diplomacy <laughs> was not diplomacy at all. No, just, just handing out animals. Just get saying, hey, I've got something crazy for you here that you've never seen before. Here's a giraffe. <laughs> yes, in fact, yeah, this was Egypt, yes. Egypt. There's examples that go way back before that though, right? In China and stuff like that. They were thousands of years BC. They were like handing around animals and saying like, here's an animal and it represents us and our characteristics. Even before the idea of like giving animals though, animals would be kept and then be a symbol. So almost right. ambassadors of like, I am awesome because I have a tiger. Yeah. Rome especially, if you think about the Colosseum and you think about the amount yeah. of different animals, particularly ones with claws and jaws. Yeah. So the nice thing about that, if you are emperor of Rome hanging out with a lion next to you, there's this nice idea of like, see what I did there? 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm in charge. Exactly. And then if you could have that perceived control of something wild, right. then that sh then shivers down the spines of your kind of you know, neighboring nations, so to speak, at that time. Yeah, so even before giving like other species as gifts, there was still this representation. So instead of actual diplomacy, be more of an ambassador for toughness or right. for a certain feel of that, that fear. And it's crazy how that's happened across all kinds of cultures across yes. time. Like you go to pretty much anywhere and you look at an indigenous like nation that they have a totem animal. They either have like right. a, a mammal or a bird or a fish or a plant or something like that. Right. It's like their identity, it's what they hold. Well, yeah, one of the pieces of the human condition is our relationship with other species. Like that defines so many of us, even on the country level, right? So for example, like the US. So again, it's not necessarily a diplomacy thing, but it is an ambassador thing or representation We've got the bald eagle America. That's like a thing and it's so integral and look at the bumper stickers and bald eagle, right? Which doesn't really have anything to do with like the land. It's not that the bald eagle is the most common species here or is the biggest species here or has been here the longest. It's it was kind of a human choice and like all countries have this, right? Right. You were telling me that you guys have one too and I, we, I have no idea what it is. We have one too. Incredibly patriotic. Let's hear it. Because we have lots of them, it's a lion. Because the wild savannas of England, like what is well, that? Well, technically you go far back far enough <laughs> and, the, and there were lions ro roaming up across, across Northern Europe. Do you know what Scotland's is? No. It's brilliant. No, I don't. It's a unicorn. That's classic Scotland. <laughs> you know what Wales is? Yes, because I have the Welsh flag in oh. my room, actually. Oh, I hosted nice. three um, fine gentlemen from Wales uh, through couch surfing, and as a token, they did not give me an animal, they gave me their flag, which has a dragon that's on it. it. So wait, it's just all mythical or things that don't even exist? At least Basically, ours is real. Yeah. But that was like heraldry. Like that would be a massive part of like your, your family heraldry would be like an animal that would occur on your thing. And, a crest. Uh, yeah, exactly, a crest. So yeah, we've seen like throughout human history, not only connection, but the fact that a species, a non-human species can be representative of a human culture and like that's fascinating. The other fascinating bit about it is not just necessarily representative. It's like in a lot of cultures we can come from that species. We, we, like, we can actually like morph from one to the other and come in from the wild natural world depending on yeah. how you want to kind of think about it and that, that we are of that, we are from that which is something that's really interesting right. as a dynamic which it's kind of like being lost with our connection to, to nature. But historically, we're like, we are wolf, we have come from wolf, and, and we can go back and right. forwards with that. And that's like, that is fascinating, that how that relationship with animals changes over time. Right, and particularly reliance on. So for the, I mean, original, so Native Americans in this region, the bison, um, that was not only representative of pieces of culture, but because of the reliance on for survival, either for meat or for protection, hides and this kind of thing. Again, that becomingness. But when we go to the grocery store, for meat, a little bit different. There's not the same. We don't have that connection. We don't know where our food comes from. Yeah, it's a little yeah, bit yeah. different. We've well, got to really think about where our food comes from. You know, like the idea that a chicken fillet comes from a chicken. Like some kids would just be like, where did chicken come from? <laughs> like, they don't know. They don't have that connection, that understanding. Well, I don't know because I don't know what a fillet is. Fillet. That sounds better. <laughs> One of the things you and I are both interested in and have talked about just for fun hanging out is the idea of zoos and what it means right. for animals to be ambassadors for their own species, mm. right? So the thing with uh, diplomacy via animal trade is typically, you know, if there's a handoff, it has to live somewhere. Typically that winds up being in a zoo. A zoo. Yeah, and yeah. so we see some amazing examples of the trading and loaning, even in some cases, of species because they are so ingrained and in, that's our country, here, take care right. of it in your zoo, yeah. and this is a thing. And so what kind of examples did you come up there with? Are, well, you can go back to uh, China giving pandas to the Japanese, like- Long time ago, long, right? Long time ago. And that's kind of carried on. Like there's been examples of that. And pandas, I mean, the whole panda diplomacy thing uh, is a big thing that's kind of happened. But there's other examples, koala bears. Koala bears, and, yes. And uh, kangaroos. There appears to be real strategical, political, 
kind of like direction about yes. why these animals are, are, are being handed out. They're like, yes. they, there's a massive agenda there. And panda diplomacy, which I mean, we put in quotations. The reason why is because it is a thing. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is, we're not making this up for the first time. Nope. This is absolutely a term and goes back a long time. Now with the US and China, the first example was um, one of the big ones that like made the news was uh, to President Nixon in, right. in the early 70s. Oh, it's such a press op, right? Like, let's take our photos of the first lady uh -huh. with the panda, with the things, look, we're friends, look, we're doing, we have a panda. Edward Heath, who was our prime minister at the time, was like, wait a minute, you get two pandas? We want two pandas. So a little bit later, we get two pandas from China. But by that point, the Chinese were like, hmm. We can do this better. We'll make let's make it a ten-year block that we're tied into here, and we're going to charge you what is a million dollars, and then it's something crazy like three or four hundred thousand dollars for the, if they have babies. If they have babies, if they have babies, right? And it's yeah. a it's a loan, and that's a very fascinating thing if you think of international relations. The idea of it's not a gift because when something's a gift and things go sour, right. you're still like, well, after this breakup, I'm still keeping the. China set, <laughs> but if you're loaning something, if you're like borrowing it, and then there's a bad breakup, like that gets really awkward. Well, and there's examples where the Chinese are actually withheld pandas, like right. or like the, with the China, China and Taiwan, all kinds of like yes. political uh, throughout the going and going on now in terms of like right. where does Taiwan actually sit? Where does it doesn't sit? Oh, we're going to give you some pandas. Oh no, we're going to withhold those pandas for you a little bit. You have lost your panda privileges, <laughs> Taiwan. <laughs> that is insane. That a single species, just because it happens to live somewhere, is then an absolute tool in this larger, um, incredible thing that this other species is doing. Yeah. Flip the coin. Imagine if pandas, for diplomacy, like traded humans. I mean, that is, <laughs> it's like laughable because it's so wild, but that's what we're doing. Yeah. I think the examples of uh, animals being used in this way is on the decline. Gradually. So we're going to situation well now. Are, are, as the public, are we are we are we happy with that? Can we condone that? Where do we see this idea of ownership of animals? Because right. it's it doesn't sit right with a lot of people. But then it's really interesting different cultures that that would be accept that would be acceptable and wouldn't be acceptable. And there's like historical examples yeah. of, of that where the queen would have ambassadors come to to dinner and have her corgi sitting down and where the ambassador came from, the dogs are seen as kind of dirty and they're like why queenie that. Um, cultural kind of like specificity of how people perceive those yes. in the individual types of animals. Yes. That was happening way back. And now it's, is our animals still, is it still cool to use animals in that kind of diplomatic way or not? So we can look at some recent examples. So the, the G20 from a couple years yeah. ago w uh, was in Australia and there was an absolute uh, photo op bonanza, right? So, I mean, it's all these world leaders. They're about to have to go into a room and talk about conflict kind of things, but they all are like, hold on. We have koalas, maybe koala break first. There's still something there. There's yeah. still a human animal connection that is strong enough, even in a modern society, to actually represent a country and to be a token of goodwill or a token yeah. of something. And I, that's, that's where it's kind of like, you know, we have that, that connection, that feeling on, on many individual personal levels, which has kind of gone out into communities and cultural levels. But then when it becomes politicized, it becomes sinister. In order to use something as a diplomat or an ambassador representative. The subtext here is that we own this and the ah. we as humans and that this is another species. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How fair is it we humans have drawn lines, fake lines, these right. are imaginary yeah. lines. In some cases, maybe some fences, but country lines, we did that. That doesn't have to do with biome necessarily or where a species range is. A species can exist in multiple human derived countries. Right. So then it's odd to say, this is ours, this is ours. so much so that here, have one, as diplomacy. How do you feel about that? It doesn't sit quite right with me. Yeah, it's a kind of like a weird kind of like we're 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 still trying to assert our dominance on on other animals when we are in a position that we uh, have the intelligence to understand our kind of place in the natural world and the impact that we have upon it and, and upon these animals. And so, yes, we have a responsibility to kind of like be, be looking after them, but that idea of ownership and kind of, of manipulating that to, to get our own way on our own agenda yeah. feels kind of weird inside. It's a little strange. It and the thing strange. is that everyone's guilty of it. Again, this isn't a one culture thing. This no. is a human history, yeah, human yeah. time, because the human experience is one that interacts with other species. Good, bad, use, non-use. I think it's fascinating that an animal can represent so much. At the end of the day, they are their own species. And I think that animals maybe should only be ambassadors for themselves. Right. On this earth and for what they need and the space that they're occupying. 
Growing up, I was obsessed with mythology, and most of my favorite myths had to do with life on Earth. For our last video in this series, we explored nature in the context of world mythology, and my friend Adrian helped me act out some myths selected from across the globe. We'll begin with an origin tale from North America. This is the story of Sedna, goddess of the sea, and how the ocean creatures came to be. It begins with Sedna, a young woman with an independent spirit and a strong-willed nature. My kind of girl. She receives a ton of advances from local suitors, but decides to give them all a hard no and takes her love life into her own hands. She chooses a mysterious out-of-town lover and is carried away by him. The catch is that he's actually a seabird in disguise, and when her dad gets word of this, he's all like, not my daughter. Sedna's father goes to rescue her from the seabird love nest she's been hauled off to. He gets her into his boat, but the seabird lover isn't having any of it, so he creates a giant storm. Dad gets scared and decides, nope, not worth it, and tries to throw Sedna into the sea. But Sedna is strong and isn't planning on going down without a fight. So she hangs onto the side of the boat and tries to plead with her father. Unfortunately, dad is both afraid and selfish and does everything he can to get rid of Sedna. First, he grabs his knife and swings it down onto her fingers. Not his best parenting moment, but hey, it was a big storm and things weren't looking great. The fingers became the seals in the sea. When Sedna tried to still hang on, her father cut off her hands. These became the warruses. And when she still tried to cling onto the boat, her father cut off her limbs. These, the largest body parts, became the whales. As she fell to the depths of the sea, Sedna became the goddess of the sea and the creatures in it. While a decently gory legend, Sedna is a central part of Inuit culture as she controls the animals which sustain these people to this day. Sticking to the theme of strong female characters, our next myth comes to us from the Gwini on the north coast of Western Australia. It's the story of Menawi and explains why the crocodile rolls to kill its prey. The story begins with a lovely day at the beach. The men had caught fish, the women were preparing food, and everyone was having a great time. Everyone, that is, except for Menawi, who was a constant troublemaker since birth. She'd cause fights, tell lies, and was even described as having a hard and scaly face. Spoiler alert. The women warned her that something terrible would happen if she didn't shape up, but that didn't stop Minawi from continuing to be the worst. Once she was older, Minawi and the other young women were ready to be married off. The elders chose a man for each woman, and everyone was paired off, except Minawi. Sort of like being picked last for dodgeball, except in a weird, patriarchal, gotta get married, traditional kind of way or something. Either way, Minowi was in a terrible mood about this, so she became even more awful. After a while, the elders were over it and set an ambush for Minowi. As she walked one day, the men of the tribe captured her and rolled her around in the dirt. But she escaped and ran to the edge of the sea. She was less than pleased about this punishment and called on the spirits to turn her into a dangerous creature in order to get revenge on the men. That animal was none other than the crocodile. And after her transformation, Menawi slid into the water and hid until later when one of the men went hunting for crabs and fish in the water. And I bet you know where this is headed. Minowi wasn't a two wrongs don't make a right kind of gal, so she exacted revenge by attacking the man and rolling him around in the water until he was dead. According to the legend, the mean spirit of Minowi lives on in the crocodiles of Australia, and it's why they roll to kill their prey. Also, pretty much a cautionary tale about not being awful to everyone in your village. While some myths and legends explain the origin of animals that are dangerous to humans, there are also origin myths for some of the most beloved species on Earth. Take the elephant, for example, and the following tale from the Kamba in Kenya. The legend begins with a very poor man and a very benevolent rich man named Ivonyangia, which translates to he that feeds the poor. But just in case I'm butchering that, we are going to refer to him as the rich man from here on out. The poor man figures it might be worth it to find the benevolent rich man and so travels to find him. Once he reaches the mansion, the rich man lived up to his reputation and offered the poor man kindness and gifts. Happily ever after, right? Well, not exactly. See, the poor man wasn't in the mood for any handouts or charity, and instead asked the rich man to give him the secret of how to become rich. After some consideration, the rich man was all like, all right, 
Fair enough. Here, I've got something for you. Take this flask of ointment and rub it on your wife's upper canine teeth. It'll make them grow, and then you can sell them. The poor man figured he may as well give it a try, so he took the ointment and returned home. Explaining the plan to his wife was the harder part, but he promised her they would become really rich, so she was a good sport and went along with it. She put the ointment onto her top canine teeth, and after a few weeks, they had grown into tusks several feet long. The man convinced his wife to let him pull them out and sell them, which he did. They got a flock of goats, and all was good. However, when the wife's teeth grew again, they grew even longer than the first time, and this time she wasn't down to let the man pull them out. In addition to her teeth, her body had also grown bigger, and her skin had turned thick and gray. While fighting about having her teeth pulled, she decided she was done, and she left the house and went to live in the forest. While in the forest, she gave birth to a son who had her same thick gray skin and tusks. Try as he might, the husband kept visiting her in the forest, but could never get her to return. Instead, she continued to live in the forest and gave birth to to many more children. The wife was the very first elephant, and all of her children born in the forest were the first population of this species. According to the tale, this is how the elephant came to be, and the reason why elephants have such amazing memories and are as intelligent as people. The last myth I'd like to share with you doesn't explain the origin of an animal, but rather the origin of a certain plant's color. This is the tale of Pyramus and Thisbe, most famously told in the Metamorphoses, written by the Roman poet Ovid. It goes something like this. Pyramus was a handsome young man living next door to a lovely young woman named Thisbe. They were super into each other, but their fathers forbade them from being together. And yes, Shakespeare totally took note of this plotline. Despite being forbidden to get together, Pyramus and Thisbe would trade sweet nothings back and forth through a small hole in the wall between their houses. One day, when they couldn't stand being apart anymore, they hatched a plan to sneak out of their houses that evening and meet up at a graveyard under the tree with snow-white fruit. Sort of goth noir romantic, sure, but it worked for them and they waited for night. Thisbe snuck out using a veil as a disguise and got to the meeting spot under the tree. But a lioness came out of nowhere looking to drink at a nearby water feature, her face covered with blood from a recent kill. Thisbe gave a hard nope to this and ran away into a cave. While running, her veil fell from her face and was left behind. And just to make sure we had a decent tragedy to work with here, the lioness mangled Thisbe's veil with her bloody mouth on the way out. Pyramus then appeared, and after seeing the lion prince and bloody veil, he assumed the worst. He cried to the heavens, oh no, it's all my fault, I asked Thisbe to come here and I got to the tree second and it's too late and I can't go on and blah. Again, Roman, Romeo, etc., etc. Pyramus picked up Thisbe's veil, sat under the tree, and stabbed himself with the sword he'd brought along in case of, oh, I don't know, lions. His blood spurted up onto the snow white berries of the tree, turning them black, and the rest of his blood seeped into the soil and roots of the tree, turning the mulberries a purple color. Thisbe eventually came out of hiding and goes back to the tree. Although she sees Pyramus, the tree's fruit is now a different color, and she's unsure as she approaches. When she gets to the tree, she sees a dying Pyramus and puts the pieces together. Pyramus dies after seeing her face, and Thisbe miserably laments that she too must now die, and the tree should thus always have dreary colored fruits suitable for lamentations. Thisbe fell on the sword, killing herself on the same knife that had killed her love. The gods took notice, however, and had pity. They made it so that the mulberry tree always has black colored fruit when it's ripe in memory of the two lost lovers. When you study something for long enough, it's hard to remember how many other ways there are to think about it. I absolutely loved exploring the overlap between nature and other fields of study, and we hope you did as well. Thanks so much for watching, and if you'd like to keep going on Life on Earth adventures with us here on Nature League, make sure to go to youtube.com slash nature league, subscribe, and share. Hey guys, we now have a Nature League pin on dftba.com. Click on the link in the description below to get yours.